Hello. Good morning. Good morning. This is not the official start. <laughs> Right. Well, good morning, everyone. Apologies <clears throat> again for uh, just a bit of a delay and, uh, and again for not being able to be with you again this morning. Sadly, the last couple of days, we are still testing positive, which means I have been unable to leave quarantine early. So it ends tomorrow anyway. Um, and so I do apologize. I wish I could be there with you in person, but nonetheless, uh, welcome, whether you're gathered in person in the sanctuary in Kirk Hill or uh, you've gathered with us. Sorry, we can't hear you. Oh, come on. Oh, well, that's not my problem. Um, we still can't hear you. I, I'm on. That's it. There we go. Can you hear me now? Okay. Um, all right, well, I'll, I'll start. I'll start from scratch. Uh, again, just a, a warm welcome to you, whether you are able to join us in the sanctuary in Kirkhill or whether you're joining us at home. I do apologize that I am unable again today to join you. So um, in order to get out of quarantine early, I would have had to test negative on a couple of LFTs this morning and yesterday. And sadly, I haven't. So my quarantine is due to end tomorrow anyway. Um, but I'm absolutely gutted not to be with you in person. So. Thankfully, um, we have the technology available to be able to do uh, what we are doing, uh, albeit uh, not ideal. Um, so thank you for your patience. And it's just good to be able to worship in creative and uh, in electronic ways, I guess. And so uh, may the Lord bless us as we endeavor to, to make the best of our situation here this morning. So just a couple of intimations to, to kick us off. Uh, because of all the changes that have taken place with regards to our own travel details, um, we're going to have to change the, the start date of the youth group. Um, and so it, it will now be the 26th of March rather than the 12th of March. So just note that in your diary and more details to come closer to the day. Uh, also, we, we still need some flower uh, rota names, a little help there. So I think I believe there is uh, sheets in the back of both churches, please do fill them in. Uh, your, your services are dearly required. Um, and so we are due to travel this week, and uh, we'll have someone in the house watching the dogs for us. But uh, more importantly, we will, uh, we will have Pastor Les Bradley to take the service next week. And so uh, I'm, I'm keen to uh, just keen to see what Les uh, you know, brings from, from what the Lord lays on his heart. Uh, one other thing I just want to bring to our attention, I know it might become part of uh, the service later on, but I just also want to bring to your attention uh, just a continued call for prayer for Catherine Kemp and, and Cameron and Mari. So, um, yeah, we just, I think, need to push through in prayer to, to continue to see Catherine improve. And so uh, I just want to commit Catherine and the, and the Kemp family to you. And, uh, and lastly, just a reminder for elders, a session meeting on the 7th and details are in uh, email. So make sure you check there. Uh, and then I, I believe you've got teas and coffees after the service. So enjoy. Um, we'd like to begin with uh, our call to worship from Psalm 99. And, uh, and keep in mind, uh, given everything that's going on in the world just now, uh, these are the lectionary readings. I did not choose these specifically, but uh, great, grateful that God is sovereign. And so the first five verses of Psalm 99, to settle our hearts and our minds on things above and our worship of the Lord. The psalmist writes, the Lord reigns, let the nations tremble. He sits enthroned between the cherubim, let the earth shake. Great is the Lord in Zion. He is exalted over all the nations. Let them praise your great and awesome name. He is holy. The king is mighty. He loves justice. You have established equity. In Jacob, you have done what is right, what is just and right. Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his footstool, for he is holy. Amen. 
Well, let us sing the first of our songs of praise, and I'll turn it over to Lenora to do just that. We knew this mass and the light could not go well together. <laughs> okay, we're going to, to stand and sing holy, holy, holy truths about our, our unchanging God who despite worldwide situations is the same yesterday today and forever so let's stand to sing holy 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 Lord God almighty first verse again in case you don't know the words. Holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty Saints adore thee. Holy, 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 all the saints adore thee, casting down their golden crowns around the glassy sea. Cherubim and seraphim fall. darkness hide thee. Almighty, all thy works shall praise thy name in earth and sky and sea. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, all thy works shall praise thy name in earth and sky and sea. Holy, holy, and mighty God in three persons blessed Trinity Amen. Thank you very much, Lenora. And if you haven't already taken a seat, please do so. Um,
let us now just commit ourselves and our worship and our service to the Lord in prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we marvel at your glory and your goodness. Your holiness is, is beyond what we are able to, to fathom, to grasp. Your holiness, if anything, highlights our unholiness. And we are acutely aware of all that is wrong within us. And so again, we come before you, recognizing that you are the one who cleanses. You are the one who reveals. You are the one who refines. And you are the one who forgives. And so in this moment, Lord, we confess our need for you. And ask that again, you would renew a right spirit within us. Cleanse us. We, we repent of our sins again today and ask that you would equip us, that you would affirm within us the call that you have placed to be your people. Grant us a grace to be able to worship you today, to boldly approach your throne, to receive from your word, and to know intimate relationship with your Holy Spirit. Open our hearts and our minds to hear and to receive today. Lord, may we be a blessing to you and a blessing to our brothers and sisters, both in, in person and those located at home. In all things, Lord, may we be pleasing to you. May we reflect uh, rightly the love that you have placed within us. May we be mirrors as to your glory and your goodness for your honor, but also for the benefit of those who are yet to know you and need to know you. And so, Lord, we continue to pray for uh, our, our congregation and the communities in which we live, Lord. Your word promises a harvest. May we be ready for such a thing even today. But may we each ourselves take time to examine, to look within us, Lord, to know what it is that you would like uh, to minister to today. We pray for those among us with needs, those who are struggling, those known to us, who, who are just not feeling 100%. And we pray for your ministry, for your Holy Spirit to be poured out. That we might know your healing, that we might know your care and your compassion this morning and this day. And so, Lord, we commit ourselves to you, our service. We invite you, Holy Spirit, to have your way among us. And so, again, would you hear us as we pray the familiar prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. One thing we are aware of is that uh, God is the author of our salvation, and he is indeed mighty to save. And so I'll turn it back over to Lenora to lead us in our next song of praise and worship. song anyway um, when I was practicing it yesterday I was also thinking it's a, it's, a, it's a song of praise and worship but it's also a prayer um, my God is mighty to save he is mighty to save and we all know of situations apart from the really obvious global situation where we are needing to know that God is mighty to save um, so when we, we sing it if you can't follow along with the words then pray along in your heart and remember that God is mighty to save. I'll just read out the words to the first verse. Lots of us, I think, you know it. 
Everyone needs compassion, love that's never failing. Let mercy follow me. Everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of the Savior, the hope of nations. Savior, he can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever, author of salvation. He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. So let's stand to sing. Um, and maybe the words will join us. Everyone needs compassion, love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of the Savior, the hope of nations. Sing that again. Everyone needs passion love that's never failing let mercy fall on me everyone needs forgiveness the kindness of a savior the hope of nations savior he can move the Thanks again, Lenora. Have a seat. Uh, not already done that. Um, okay, now moving to a kids' talk. Um, it, this is it's such a bizarre setup because I don't even know if there's actually any kids. I can see you, Lenora. Can you give me a wave if there's kids actually in the place? All right. So there are kids. How many? Six. Six. Great. Okay. Good. All right. So I have to take this in faith. This is very. It's very weird not being able to kind of um, see folk and, and, and kind of interact. So um, anyway, uh, so anyway, I want to talk today about transformation. Now, oh, before, before I, I talk about transformation, did anybody who's in 
in the congregation there actually work on Psalm 1, even though we kind of missed the mark last week? Has anybody memorized Psalm 1? Nobody's giving me a wave, so I'll just take it that, uh, all right, cool. Just thought I would ask. Okay, so transformation. We see some amazing transformations, and I would, if, if I was present, I would have had things to kind of show, but it's difficult here on the computer. So instead, we just have to think of things that we know, um, go, go through or experience transformation in creation. And so one of the first things I thought of was, was caterpillars. Caterpillars end up in the cocoon, and then before too long, they, they come forth as butterflies or moths. Something else that goes through an incredible transformation is, is coal, where through uh, the passage of time and pressure and heat becomes something as, as marvelous as a diamond. A grain of sand in, in the middle of an oyster transforms into a pearl. And then in, in the middle of winter, we see all sorts of transformation from water into ice and ice into water. And then, of course, we know uh, when you boil the kettle, of course, water turns into steam. Again, another transformation. Transformation takes place all around us. But do we also realize that we ourselves as human beings, as men, women, as young and old, we can all be transformed ourselves? So there's a passage in Romans 12.2 that says, Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And Paul goes on to say that then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good and pleasing and perfect will. Wouldn't you love to know what God would like you to do in any certain situation? Wouldn't you like to just be able to say, ah, what would God do? You know, we used to have the, the bracelets we used to wear as young people saying, what would Jesus do? And this is exactly that. Maybe in junior church, you, you've been told, and I hope you have, um, but, you know, back to Genesis, that we are each made in God's image. And so we are like him in many ways, you know, in, in our emotional response and character. We're capable of loving. We're capable of sacrificing for others. Things that we get directly from God himself. But we still do things that actually eh, probably don't please him. There's still room for improvement. And that's what our, our scripture in Romans 12, 2 reminds us, that we can be transformed. Now, the first thing I thought about when I thought about the word transform is I thought about transformers. When I was a young boy, we used to have the toys transformers. and I know they're still around. How You could change from a car to a robot or a plane to a robot. Um, and, and so, yeah, but that's not quite right. We want to be more and more like God. We want to be transformed to be more like him closer to his image, the way he treats people, the way he loves, the way he looks upon folk, the way he gives out mercy and forgiveness. And so uh, the way we become more like God is, is by his Holy Spirit. Now that may sound a bit weird, but what does that look like? How, how are we changed by his Holy Spirit? Well, we can do things like pray. We can do things like read the Bible. We can learn scripture. We can memorize scripture. Psalm 1 still out there, folks. Highly recommend it. When we read the Bible, when, when we talk to God, when we talk to one another about God and we learn from one another, we allow God through his Holy Spirit to transform us, to shape us. Spending time with God helps us to become more like him. It changes us for the better. Because the interesting thing is for all of those things I mentioned earlier, for, uh, for the caterpillar, for the coal, for the oyster, the, the grain of sand and the oyster, and for the water, all of these transformations take a little bit of time, some longer than others. But if we want to be transformed to be more than and more and more like God, well, that takes time too. We have to just spend more and more time with Him to become more and more like Him. So that's it. And I just want to leave you with that thought this morning. Okay, but before we let you go to junior church, I'll turn it back over to Lenora. We'll sing Light of the World. Here's 
Amen. All right, let's pray for our young people and then we'll release them to junior church. So Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for uh, all the generations that you bring us into. Thank you for the family that is the church, your bride. And uh, we just want to ask your blessing upon our young people today as they go off to junior church. Would you bless them and those who will give them instruction? Help us as a community to, to love and to support them, to model well your word, your precepts, your love and character. May we be a discipling family for your honor and glory and for the benefit uh, of, of our family. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Now, as the children leave, I would like to invite uh, Ian to bring us readings from God's word this morning. The Old Testament reading is from Exodus 34, uh, the radiant face of Moses. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the covenant law in his hands, he was not aware that his face was radiant because he had spoken with the Lord. When Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses, his face was radiant and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them, so Aaron and all the leaders of the community came back to him, and he spoke to them. Afterwards, all the Israelites came near him, and he gave them all the commands the Lord had given him on Mount Sinai. When Moses finished speaking to them, he put a veil over his face. But whenever he entered the Lord's presence to speak with him, he removed the veil until he came out. And when he came out and told the Israelites what he had been commanded, they saw that his face was radiant. Then Moses would put the veil back over his face until he went in to speak with the Lord. And the New Testament is from Luke 9, the Transfiguration. About eight days after Jesus said this, that was when he foretold his own death. He took Peter, John, and James with him and went up onto a mountain to pray. As he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. Two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared in glorious splendor, talking with Jesus. They spoke about his departure, which he was about to bring to fulfillment at Jerusalem. Peter and his companions were very sleepy, but when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men standing with him. As the men were leaving, Jesus, Peter said to him, Master, it's good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what he was saying. While he was speaking, a cloud appeared and covered them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. A voice came from the cloud saying, this is my son whom I have chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, they found that Jesus was alone. The disciples kept this to themselves and did not tell anyone at that time what they had seen. Amen. Thank you, Ian. <clears throat> so for a word from, from the Lord to our congregation this morning, I, I have to start by just being completely honest. It's been, it's been a week full of all sorts of emotion. I'm usually a pretty upbeat, uh, easygoing, positive sort of guy. But if I'm honest, inwardly this week, I've experienced a great deal of, of turmoil, uh, not to mention feeling rotten uh, due to COVID has probably only made things uh, a little bit worse. But I don't think we can carry on without at least mentioning first what is, what is going on in, in Ukraine. Um, for me personally, many of you know that the Kuzma side is, is Ukrainian and, uh, and that I also speak Russian uh, and that has shaped some of, of who I am. 
Uh, and so for me personally, and I'm just talking about, you know, my own situation, I, I felt angry. I felt, I felt sad. I felt dismayed and disappointed at times over the last number of days. And, and many of you can probably relate. Uh, it will be on a number of hearts and minds uh, today and, and rightly so as we, as we turn on the news and we just see what just seems to be unbelievable in our modern era. Um, yeah. And so I just want to, to just talk about the elephant in the room for a moment, because um, the one thing that I'm also realizing is, is young people have, have never been more connected than they are just now. And, and so if you do have young people near or about you in your home or, or that you come across, please do make sure to give them a, a chance to talk. We don't know exactly what's the, what this means, and, and it's certainly um, not, not positive, but um, people, people will suffer, people will, will die, and, and I go so far as to say needlessly. There will be pain, and there's uncertainty, and there will be a knock-on effect as to what this means. Um, you know, and, and we realize probably now more than ever that we are, we live in a global community. And, uh, and so uh, all I want to say really is that be sure to be giving things to Jesus, pray, read, talk to one another, bring comfort, bring encouragement, uh, a, a word in season, worship, but give, give the burdens of all of this, the worries and the concerns, take them all to the Lord in prayer. Um, and, and as I look ahead to the word today and, and just in preparation for uh, this week's service, I just find it interesting what the Lord had been speaking about or, or speaking to us over the last couple of weeks. And what has he been telling us? Just a bit of a, a recap. A couple of weeks ago, we talked about hope. Uh, and, and last week we spoke about the holiness of God, and that God is in control and has a plan. And that was the same two weeks ago as it is today. Whatever is going on, good, bad, or otherwise, in our lives, in our communities, in our planet, we have to, we have to ground ourselves and say, guess what? God is still in control. This is still his creation. Uh, he is still the sovereign Lord of absolutely everything. And so two weeks ago, we looked at Joseph and, uh, and, and Joseph, the words to his brother, uh, or sorry, to all of his brothers, if you recall, when they finally did catch up with him in Egypt, he says, God meant it for good. And then last week, we looked at, at what it meant, what it means to be set apart, to be different, to be used of him. And the one thing that uh, challenge and trial brings us is the opportunity to show how we are set apart, to show what God is capable of through us and vicariously through his church. And then, uh, you know, just the, the way in which he can transform situations. And so God is still our hope in the midst of life, in the midst of war, in the midst of peace. And we model that hope for others in the midst of things. And so, as I shared a couple of weeks ago, we can only... We can only share with others what we ourselves have. And so if you have a great need for peace, then you know what? I'm just going to say, get on your knees, boldly approach the throne and seek that peace. Seek that hope because it, it's only going to increase in need for those around about us. He is the source of that hope and salvation from sin and from all manners of trials that the, the world and life will, will throw at us. And so are, are we surprised that he's given us a couple of weeks head start to prepare for what is currently going on? God does have a plan. And, and in many ways, I'll say he also has a sense of humor. Because if last week, if you were taking notes, you probably had me, uh, well, you would have heard me say, uh, you know, who wouldn't like to hand out a bit of justice? Who wouldn't like to teach someone a lesson? Well, I've got a name that comes to mind this morning, but I do humbly appreciate it when God makes me eat, meditate, and chew on my own words so that I, in turn, move towards and look at his. And so uh, my encouragement will be 
and, and will continue to be for myself and for everyone else, continue to seek his face and to pray. And then when you've done that, do it again and seek his face and pray some more. Pray into his plans. Because it's only in the midst and, and, and when God is in control and when things are in his hands that he turns the bottom of the well experiences like Joseph into a, a nation's salvation. Where he turns a cross, a symbol of death and torture, into an eternal symbol of hope. So make no mistake, God is still very much at work this morning all through creation. We might not understand it. His plan is in process uh, and we are still called to be set apart and different for his honor and glory, living in his hope. And so if what you see on the telly uh, breaks your heart um, and you wish you could fight, well, you can. And I would say fight in prayer. If what you hear on the news or, or the testimonies makes you mad, good. Then fight in prayer. These are the weapons that have been fashioned for us. These are the weapons that we are given to use. And so if someone is ill, guess what? We fight for them in prayer. And I mentioned earlier, and I mentioned again, just the situation of, of Catherine Kemp, who's still not doing very well. We need to see the pressure relieved on her brain. Uh, she's fighting infection. And so today, would you join us as we continue to battle in prayer for these situations like Ukraine? for those who are ill and in need of a touch, for those who are suffering, for those who are hurting. There are battles in other nations and there are battles here in our own communities. But do talk to and remember, God has a plan. And so with that in mind, um, our passages today, uh, you know, Exodus 34, the glowing complexion of Moses. Moses has gone up a second time to Mount Sinai to get another set of stone tablets, having dealt with the fiasco that was the golden calf. And so his second stint, 40 days and 40 nights, Moses and God meet on the mountain. And Moses continues to get all sorts of instructions from the Father for the good and the future of Israel while he's there. Helpful info. But what's interesting is before Moses climbs again Mount Sinai, he and the Lord are, are still in conversation. And so if you back up to, to chapter 33, verse 16, you get Moses asking of the Lord, how will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? Given the nature of Israel and the account of the golden calf, this actually seems like a really good question from Moses. How will other nations know we are yours, God? And how will the people know you want me to lead them? That's the substance of what he's asking of the Lord. And so verses 19 to 23, God tells Moses what's going to happen. And that God and his glory will pass by Moses, who will be hidden in a cleft already predetermined by, by God in the rock, who will shield Moses from his holy face using his own hand. And so Moses does eventually climb the mountain. 40 days later comes down a new set of commandments, which are set in stone by God's own hand. And we see the visible effects this visit has had on Moses. We are told, as Ian read earlier, Moses' face shone and was radiant. So much so that the response of his leaders and brother was to distance themselves. And the word tells us that Moses was, was even unaware of his own shining, his own shimmering. So once he became aware, he veiled himself for the benefit of those around him and then unveiled himself to enter into the presence of God. A couple things to think about within this passage. And, and I'll be honest, it was kind of news to me as well. I'd never really thought about it this way. But nowhere in the remainder of the word of God following this passage, at no point in scripture, are we told that the radiance of the glory of the Lord ever wears off or diminishes from Moses. Moses could have been shining for the duration of his life. A permanent reminder of his encounter with the intense and intimate presence of God. 
Our second passage, Luke 9, 28 to 36. And there's a couple of things worth noting in the midst. There's a great deal going on. And I think God is, is highlighting and accomplishing several things at once in this Mount of Transfiguration account. Some of what he's highlighting, I think, is for the knowledge of others. For Jesus appears with Moses and Elijah. And God is, is stating for the record that Jesus is not Moses or Elijah. It was a question that was posed to Jesus and to John the Baptist. And likely that something that people were, were wondering or were curious about. And here we see Jesus. He appears as his own person. And in actual fact, he is the fulfillment of the law and the prophets that both Moses and Elijah represent. And, and as the passage continues, we're told that Jesus is, you know, speaks of his departure or, or has a conversation with Moses and Elijah regarding his departure. And maybe this is to receive instruction or encouragement for his journey to Jerusalem and, and what is to come. We don't know. But then we have this account of Peter, and, and Peter, what I would say, is, is putting his foot in. He just doesn't know quite what to do when, when faced with such a situation. And God interrupts Peter and descends as a cloud, which is the very Old Testament motif of, of God's presence. Something known to the disciples. And it reaffirms with words the call and Jesus, or the call of Jesus. And that he is God's son and that the disciples should listen to him. Just as the pillar went ahead of the Israelites during the exodus, so the cloud contains the presence of God in this situation. And of course, we read uh, and should not fail to point out that Jesus is revealed in his full glory, his own glory, his own transfiguration and witnessed by the three. And so this morning, I just want to pull out really just a couple of points for us to take away and into the week ahead. And the first point is this, that you know when someone encounters God. I've said it before, it, it changes a person. I've spoken of people in my own life, the, the change within uh, my own stepfather, literally overnight. It's actually his birthday today. I have to give him a call. But what I find interesting like Moses, they might not even be aware that they have changed or been transformed, but it's clear to others. In a previous congregation, we, we had a lovely, uh, a lovely woman, a, a, an amazingly godly woman by the name of Sandra. And she wore a perpetual smile. She was always encouraging. She praised God in all manner of situations. And what was remarkable about that is that she was actually in constant pain riddled with arthritis in probably every joint of her body. And yet she would walk a mile uh, to the church to help out the young people. I would point out she's in her 80s. And when the young people would, would, would ask me, what does love look like in real life? I would just point to Sandra. If they ask, what does a godly response look like to tough situations? I would just simply say, Sandra. The love of God radiates to this day out of Sandra, and I find her incredibly inspiring. And so you know when you meet someone who reflects the glory of God, they would say it was nothing for them. It's just a humble response to the reality of who they, they know themselves to be in Christ. But the rest of us know they are different. We know that there's an element of, of their set-apartness. There's something of a holy working within them. And why do the lights of the Sandras of the world radiate the glory of God so much? Because like Moses, they were constantly spending time with him. That's it. That's, that's the answer. And so last week we, we spoke of the holiness, and it takes us back to that, to be set apart to be used of God. And so the question that I ask myself and that I put to you folks as the church this morning is, are you willing to allow God to use you? Are you willing, are you seeking to live 
in such a way as to reflect the glory and the radiance of God? Are you willing to do what it takes to spend that time with him? That time that, that allows you to radiate, not that you, you seek just to radiate, but actually you just seek to spend time with God so much that you are actually transformed in his presence. Little by little, as the time passes, because you are solely focused upon him. Second thing I want to bring forth this morning is that when one encounters God and or his glory, it brings about a response in others. And so in Exodus 34, we see the first response is, is this fear. Aaron, Moses' own brother in the Israelites, saw Moses' radius, radiant face, and they were afraid to come near. <laughs> They, they were walking away. They were trying to get away from the glow and the glory until Moses spoke to them. Sometimes the, the response to, to encountering the glory and the presence of God is, is one of, of just an awkwardness of, of, of not sure how to properly respond. Um, and we see this in Peter. Uh, oh, this is great. Uh, let, let's build tents for everyone. Uh, okay, that would not have been my thought, but Peter being rudely awoken uh, is unsure of his response, and, and so it's a bit clumsy. And I often find that in my experience as a minister, as a Christian, there, there are two types of people um, where God is concerned. You, you have people who run from God, often because they, they feel shame as they're aware of their their unholy situation when placed next to the holiness of the father the son or the spirit but so if you recall a few weeks previous uh, peter in the boats with the miraculous catch of fish and as peter is hauling in the fish he stops and he turns to jesus and he says you need to get away from me because you are clearly holy and i know i am unholy Peter just wanted to give that distance, just like Aaron and the Israelite leaders. And it's almost like we see this in, in, in the response of someone who's choking. And when we begin to choke, what, what do we often do? We, we seek to try and get alone, to, to isolate ourselves. We, we know we probably don't look at our best. Uh, but in doing so, we're isolating ourselves from those who are best able to help us. And I think it's something of a physical example of a spiritual truth as well. And so when confronted with the holiness of God, the realization of our own situation causes us to want to recoil and to turn the other way from the Father. But equally, I've seen in individuals, uh, there's a response that, that there are those who run to him because he is the one who can meet the need. And one classic example is, is the woman who had the issue of bleeding. And so for whatever reason, people get to the point where they either recognize, either through experience, that, that actually Jesus is the one who can make a positive change in this situation. Or even out of desperation where all other avenues have been exhausted, we approach Jesus. And the reality is, is he will meet that need. But for our passage in Exodus 34, what, what brings the leaders back to Moses? It's his voice. And with that voice comes a relationship, a trust that has been built. They never really seem to get over the glow, so Moses has to stifle the glory of God that remains upon him so that they can function well. But the sound of Moses' voice, those complexion changes, his voice doesn't. And so when we know and are familiar with the voice of the Father and the Son and the Spirit, we are able to remain when others would flee. My sheep know my voice. When we see things that don't make sense, we can trust where others might struggle. But the other thing uh, that happens, another response that we have when we encounter the glory and the presence is that we are awakened 
the presence, the glory wakens us up. And time and again, we see this in our, in our well, it was representative of our Luke 9 passage. The disciples are forced awake at the awareness of the glory of Christ with Moses and Elijah. But think also of Saul, who's along the road and later becomes Paul, where he equally is awakened by an intense encounter with God. Peter, James, and John are a bit dozy after the hike up. But 32, verse 32 tells us. And it brings to mind the the same sort of thing will will happen in the days ahead in the Garden of Gethsemane. And William Barclay, in his commentary, brings some some points that I think are, are worth noting again this morning. He believes we miss a great deal in life because we are asleep spiritually. And he adds to his, his writings things that he believes keep us asleep. And so it's just a wee bit of a list. So briefly, the first thing he mentions is prejudice. That being closed-minded, no longer willing to debate or to entertain new thoughts. And I think we see this in what we now call cancel culture. It's a modern version of this. As long as you agree with me, that's fine, but I'm not open to actually looking at your ideas because I'm so right that you have to be wrong. The other thing he mentions is is mental lethargy, a refusal to struggle strenuously in thought, a refusal to examine one's life. We choose to skirt around rather than tackle or wrestle with the, the doubts or the questions we have in life or even within faith. And the last thing he he mentions is is our our love for ease and comfort as the final thing that really keeps us asleep as a church. Our default mechanism is is to close the door on disturbing or challenging thoughts. He also points out that there are things in life that are designed to wake us up. Sorrow, tragedy, love, and our own needs. And how do these waken us up? Well, we become acutely aware of the presence of God and that he is the one who is able to meet those needs. And so the question that comes to mind for me as I was preparing for this and maybe for you again this morning is am I currently asleep? What have I missed? What am I currently missing? What about the church? Is the church asleep? Have we fallen into one of these categories of Barclay's list? What is God seeking to affirm round about us? What do we need to wake up to? What examination does our lives or do our lives require? Lots of questions with answers that I don't readily have available yet. There's work to be done. And so just quickly, a bit of an application. At a service not that long ago, I read from Ecclesiastes chapter 3. You know the one, there's a song about it. There's a season for this and that. There's a season for everything under the sun. And it reminds us that there are seasons under heaven. And some seasons are difficult. They're difficult to understand. They're difficult to fathom. But we must wrestle with them and not avoid them. We must ask God to reveal his glory in the midst of these situations and what our response should be. He is our hope. There's no point in running away from him, but instead we must ask him to awaken us to what he is doing. We need to look to encounter God in prayer through reading his word, through worship of him, the still small voice in the silence. As we read the news, And as we observe in creation, we must look to encounter him. And then when we do see his glory, run as fast as we can towards it and embrace it. Embrace his hope that comes through it. Because who here isn't in need of some transfiguration? Who here isn't in need of some transformation? If we realize that, then the only correct response for us is to make the time to spend with the Father 
to allow him to make that transformation come alive in us. We might not be able to go up a mountain for 40 days and 40 nights with him, but you might be able to make four minutes, 40 minutes, four hours, four moments. The length doesn't matter. Just make the time because time with him is what will transform us into more and more like his son, to, ha to having responses, to loving, to seeing, to granting mercy, to forgiving, and to being that bit more set apart for a world that is only going to increase its need for a savior. And we know who that is. And so I just want to leave these thoughts with you. May God bless you, guide you, and encourage you and draw you into that holy place of encounter with him. Amen. I thought it would be appropriate this morning to sing as a response the familiar, the familiar hymn, My Hope is Built on Nothing Less Than Jesus' Blood and Righteousness. Now let us turn to prayers for others. Um, we're going to pray first of all for some things locally, and then we're going to use a prayer from 24-7, which is a, a prayer for the crisis in Ukraine that um, we'll pray for some local I should say when we get to the prayer for crisis in Ukraine, all the words are going to be there, and we 
I'll, I'll read and read, read and pray along either out loud or in your heart. Sorry, thank you that we can hope in you. We thank you that you are a solid rock. We thank you that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever, and that your intentions for us are good because you love us. You are just and merciful and kind and compassionate. Mm. Lord, you know that there are, are so many things that, that each of us could bring before you in prayer this morning, and that I don't know all of them, but I thank you that you do. Lord, we want to lift up Alex Grant, who's just gone into hospital today. Lord, we pray that you would be with him. He would know your peace, that you would give wisdom to the doctors, and that you would grant. Pray for John McClellan. I didn't catch, get the first of it. I couldn't get the, the, the talking. No. But I found, I don't know what he was saying, you know, there's been something happened in his life that's for healing in her body, Lord, that the infection would be taken away, Lord, that the doctors would be able to move forward with the different things that they need to do. Lord, we pray for Catherine, for Mary, for Carmen, and for Chris. Lord, that you would give them your peace in this situation, Lord, that they would look to you and trust in you, and that they would know you with them. Lord, we ask for them. Lord, we pray for Here's my family as they prepare to go to Canada. We ask that nothing else would stand in the way, that they would be able to get everything that they need to get home and to visit Marty's. That we pray for others that we know in similar situations who are facing illness, and in some cases, terminal illness of a loved one. That we lift them up to see. And Lord, there's so many other situations. So in this moment, where we lift up the names of those we know, Thank you, Lord, that you hear our prayers. And now, Lord, we look to the, the global situation. We pray for the crisis in Ukraine. Father God, King of all nations, we cry out to you now for the people of Ukraine. We ask you to rescue those who are vulnerable from the hands of their enemies that they may live without fear before you all their days. Hear ye, Lazon, Lord, have mercy. Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, have mercy upon us. Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, grant us peace. Lord of Lords and Prince of Peace, our politicians are predicting the biggest war in Europe since 1945, and we simply cry out to you urgently to write another story in our time. Thwart the dark machinations of evil men. Give wisdom beyond human wisdom to peacemakers seeking an equitable and less violent way. And politicians exercise the wisdom from above which is peaceable, gentle, willing to yield and full of mercy. Kiri Yelizan, Lord have mercy. Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world have mercy upon us. Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, grant us peace. Holy Spirit, we pray for the church in Ukraine, a nation in which 70% of the population call themselves Christian. Give our many brothers and sisters in that nation courage in this crisis, that they may proclaim the good news of your kingdom, bind up broken hearts, and bring comfort to all who mourn. Here you lay some. Lord, have mercy. Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, have mercy upon us. Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, grant us peace. You, Lord, make wars to cease to the end of the earth. You break bows, shatter spears, and burn shields with fire. And so we ask you now to save the lives of many people in Ukraine. Make a peace that is strong and not weak. De escalate the crisis. We hear of wars and rumors of wars, but you, Lord, are our rock, our fortress, and our deliverer. Our hope is in you. 
And so we address the nations now. In the name of Jesus, we say, be still and know God. He is exalted among the nations. He shall be exalted in the earth. Kyrie eleison, Lord, have mercy. Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, have mercy upon us. Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, grant us peace. Thank you, Lenora. Um, I mentioned earlier one of the, the greatest weapons that we've been given is prayer. Um, another great weapon that we've been given is worship. And so I thought we would conclude our service by just simply declaring um, the goodness of God. And so as we sing our final song of praise and worship, let us do so honoring God for who he is, recognizing that he is worthy of all of our praise, regardless of what is going on round about us. And so let us sing to God be the glory, great things he has and will do. To God be the glory, great things he has done, so let's see the world that he gave us his son, who yielded his life and atonement for sin, and opened the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth Amen. I just had uh, I just had the junior church banging on my window and dancing in front of me as we were singing our last hymn. It's just absolutely made my morning. Um, but uh, for for our benediction, I just want to read um, from Numbers six. And it says, "The Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron and his sons, This is how you are to bless the Israelites. Say to them." The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. 
So they will put my name on the Israelites and I will bless them. Go and do likewise. And may the blessing of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you to go and to live in the hope and the glory of his presence this day and evermore. Amen. God bless. Have an amazing week, folks.